Hey guys, uh, Greg Rucka here. Uh, the ARC fellow Sergio and Fernando uh, put out a request for comments and questions that I would answer via video. I have tried to answer this three times using my uh, Nikon uh, D90 video and it has failed dismally every time. So we are now using lower quality uh, iMac camera and I have questions here. And uh, because I've answered them so many darn times, uh, I apologize if the spontaneity here is gone, but I'll do my best. So, question number one. Serena Nelson asks, boxers or briefs? Inquiring minds want to know. Serena, that's a personal question. Um, but speaking personally, uh, boxer briefs, actually. I used to be a boxer guy, I admit it, but I'm also a blue jeans guy, and I discovered that blue jeans and boxers don't get along that well. And actually, if you wear boxers a lot with your blue jeans, what happens is the blue jeans tear up the boxers. Um, not sure what that says about me, but there you go. So yes, these days I'm a boxer brief guy. Now, as for briefs in general, I'm not opposed to them, but you know, not my thing. So that's your answer. Number two, Maxwell LaChance asks, what's the worst experience Alicia has ever gone through? And uh, am I making her go through anything worse in this game? And I really like actually how you phrased part two there. Am, you know, am I making her go through something worse? The answer is you bet your ass. Um, the hero's journey should not be an easy one. If it's an easy one, they're not really a hero, are they? So the worst thing she has gone to prior to what I'm going to put her through has to be getting drummed out of the police academy uh, when she was framed for uh, possession of this dangerous object, the quote-unquote golden sphere. Now, if you haven't played the game so far, Chapter 1, uh, the golden sphere is some sort of technological artifact. Alicia doesn't really know what it is or what it does. All she knows is that she was a bright young thing planning on becoming a cop on the Ark. She had been in the academy. She was following the footsteps of her father. She, uh, she was possessed with a desire to protect and to serve. Uh, and she comes back one day to her locker after training, and she opens it up, and there's this golden artifact on, this, uh, on the shelf. And she pulls it out, and she says, what the hell is this? And the next thing she knows, she's face down and has her hands behind her back, and she's being cuffed and stuffed and charged with possession of a dangerous technological item. And she's being asked where she got it, and all she can say is, I don't know. What's this about? What did I do? And the long and the short of that is, uh, she got drummed out of the academy. Uh, she wasn't charged for possession of this artifact. She wasn't ever taken to trial for stealing it because nothing could be proven, but she lost this chance at the career she wanted. That's why when we meet her, she is a journalist. She's an investigative reporter, a student. She is training for a new career, uh, a career that not unlike the one that she was initially pursuing is one about seeking out the truth and trying to help people. So that's the worst thing that has happened to her. The worst thing that's going to happen to her really depends on whether or not uh, we get to tell the story we want to tell in Chapter 3. Uh, Amex asks, You are known for writing great female characters like Carrie Statko and Tara Chase. There's Tara Chase. I don't know if you can see her. Um, what makes Alicia special? Do you find something in common with any of the characters you've written? Um... I appreciate, incidentally, saying anything in common with characters I've written, uh, as opposed to anything in common with female characters I've written. Um, Alicia actually bears... I, I was thinking about this, and, and one of the things I think that draws me to her so much, she's got a lot in common with Renee Montoya, actually. She and Renee both have this dogged insistence and, and desire to pursue the truth to such an extent that they really are willing to put themselves into fairly dangerous positions or to annoy people to such an extent that they will undoubtedly get socked in the face uh, just in pursuit of the answer to their questions. So, you know, there are parts of Alicia that I think are, you know, she shares traits with so many characters. There's a, she shares, I think, a a sense of um, purpose and duty uh, to herself and to the truth that is not unlike Lois Lane. I think that she is, she bears a lot in common with Tara Chase, her ability to think on her feet, though she is not nearly as messed up as Tara. Um, 
there, there's there's a lot about Alicia that that incorporates elements of different characters I've written, but she is entirely her own person. Now, part two of the question, um, I answered. So, <laughs> moving on. Uh, Julio says, uh, I know it's unrelated to the subject, but since uh, you are a big Bioware fan, which franchise do you like better, Dragon Age or Mass Effect? Um, I... And I, I really find it difficult to choose, honestly. If we're talking about which games I prefer, prefer I uh, you're going to be hard pressed to find me a game that's better than Mass Effect Two. Um, I loved Dragon Age Two, and I know I'm theoretically in a minority on that, but I think that some of the things that they were done doing with the form, uh, the framing of narrative, uh, the development and existence of NPCs outside of your own experience, that they all had their lives, that they were all growing, that you had impact in those lives. I found that really profoundly uh, exciting. I, I think that these kinds of role-playing games are very much the next generation in art. I think we are looking at, and we are only a few years away from, role-playing games that will be as powerful and as moving and as effective as the greatest works of literature uh, or cinema or, or stage. I really do think we're almost there. Um, in terms of the universes, you know, I love the Mass Effect universe because I love how broad it is and how beautifully realized it is, but I actually have to lean, honestly, a little more towards Dragon Age simply because I'm a detail guy and I love the, the nuts and bolts and what Bioware has done with Thedas, uh, the, the thought, the care, the effort, um, and the different layers that are apparent and the layers that are only hinted at, um, I find incredibly compelling. So, I don't know if that's a good answer, but there you go. So, we did, and we did, and Jordi Escobar. As long as drama is easy to write, kill her father, push her into desperation and some strong illness, and comedy is far more difficult, how do you mix and write comedy with mystery and suspense? A comic line word spoken sideshow NPC or just funny easy moments like step on a banana and fall? I find Woody Allen a great comedian, but not everyone is in with his weird sense of humor. I can't tell if that's a serious question, Jordy. I really can't. I think um, the implication that all you have to do is say, oh, this character, their parent died, they have a disease, therefore it's drama, is uh, wrong. I think it's just fundamentally wrong. Story comes from character. It comes from emotional connection. Um, the difference between drama uh, and comedy is tonal. You know, John Cleese is on record uh, as saying, I think he was interviewed about Faulty Towers, I remember hearing him say, that he never tried to write comedy. What he tried to write was a character who took himself very seriously. Uh, now, that seriousness became absurd in those situations, but in the comedy, nobody actually goes, ha, look at me, I'm being funny. They're, they're, th what they're doing, they're doing because they believe in it. And that's the heart of anything you're going to do dramatically in any form of writing. You cannot, you cannot be glib. And what you're describing here are shortcuts and cheats. The... You know, snappy dialogue is all well and good, but you need to give me a character that I believe is going to come from. Unless I believe in the people in the story, and I don't care what the story is, comedy, tragedy, whatever, unless I believe in them, unless there is an emotional connection, you've lost me, uh, and I couldn't be bothered. Why would I spend my money and my time on them if they're not engaging me, you know? Uh, da -da -da. Martha C. Hi, Mr. Rucka. Nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you, too. I'd be glad to know which one is your favorite moment from the point-and-click adventures you have played. P.S. I'm worried about you. Your feet have never been shown in the videos. Tell us the truth. You are still kidnapped by these guys, aren't you? I'm actually not. I'm free. I'm at home. You're in my office right now. And let's see if I can get this up here. Oh, there's a foot. And I did that without falling. Um, look, point-and-click adventures. I think we're talking about games in the style of the arc, yeah? I have to go back to Monkey Island. I have to go back to the moment where you put the rat in the Vichyssoise. I had never laughed so hard in my life. I still laugh when I think about that scene. The first time it played, I laughed literally so hard. Uh, I was out of breath. I was in pain. I fell out of the chair. And then I actually quit the game and reloaded so I could do it again to hear all the dialogue again. So 
that game was a formative game for me, obviously. And to this day, I have friends that I still will, you know, they'll say something and I'll respond with, how appropriate, you fight like a cow. And if you get that reference, you've clearly played Monkey Island. Uh, John Morin, this is our last question. John. Hi, Greg. Hi, John. I have several questions for you. How would you describe a good game in three words? In three words, I would describe a good game as compelling, meaning that there is something to it that keeps bringing me back, right? Uh, engaging, meaning that it affects me on some emotional level. Uh, and smart. I don't like dumb. Uh, I like clever. I want a game that respects my intelligence. Uh, I think, I think that's crucial. Frankly, that 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 that's what I that's those are my three words, uh, with explanations. Question two is how would you describe? Uh, no, wait. How important are you? Uh, or blah, blah, blah. it's been a long day. How important uh, are the story, graphics, and music in a game for me? Um, I am honestly not a big graphics guy, all right? Um, the technology is always improving, you know, and, and, and there's some beautiful, beautiful work being done, and I appreciate it. I, I certainly don't want to give the impression that I don't. But the graphics to me are absolutely secondary uh, to the story. I would actually rank story and music higher than graphics. Graphics are there to service. I want to be able to see beautiful things. But most importantly, I need to be able to know what the world is. I want to be able to see it. But that's the purpose of the graphics. I don't want to have to worry about, you know, having to upgrade my system yet again uh, to make sure that I get every particle effect. And there are still games that I play today that, compared to the graphics on games that have come out this year, are laughable. You know, I still play the original Fallout. I still play the original Baldur's Gate. I don't do it a lot, you know. But the reason I come back to those games, games like Planescape Torment, is because the story is brilliant. The story is consistently engaging, and, and that to me is first and foremost. Now, you talk about music, and music is the unsung hero of so many performance-slash-interactive media, right? Good music, in my opinion, should be almost invisible. It should affect you. Um, it should guide you. It should even cue you. Uh, when it is done well, it can move you to tears, and you won't even know why. When I am aware of the music, it tends to be the moment when I'm like, that's too much. It's like when you're in the movies, and all of a sudden you're going like, whoa, the score is way too loud. I want The music is supplemental. The music is not um, pr primary. To me, story is primary. And what follows are those things that must service it. Okay? So, there you go. Oh, oh wait. There was a final one from, from John. I'm sorry. He asks how I see the arc in the future. Um... That's a trick question. I can't answer it. Uh, we have to wait until the end of Chapter 4. Uh, there's a lot in this world that's just touched on. You know, I think Sergio had an idea at the beginning, and he ran with it. Um, and he left a lot of uh, open space to be filled in. So, you know, I'm very excited about the opportunity to be able to fill that in. There is a future here. Uh, if, if we make it, maybe we'll have the opportunity to explore it more. So, there you go. Those are my answers. Uh, I hope I've been only pleasantly goofy. Uh, I'd be more than happy to do this again later this week. So, if there are more questions, people should certainly submit them. Talk to you all later. Bye.